So we're doing this presentation in three sections. I'm Keith Webster, Dean of Libraries at Carnegie Mellon. I'm going to kick off with some pie in the sky, pseudo visionary stuff to try and frame the more substantive contributions that will be made by my colleagues, David Shearer and Ulla Villetson. David is on my immediate left, Ulla on the far left. Uh, firstly, I bring um, greetings from Carnegie Mellon uh, just by way of introduction, the Times Higher World Rankings place us in the top 25 universities in the world. Therefore, they are the default university rankings that we should all believe in. Uh, we have particular strengths, as many of you may know, in computer science, engineering and technology, and in the fine arts. Uh, the university was born out, or took its roots from its foundation as Carnegie Institute of Technology, uh, founded by Andrew Carnegie in 1900. 50 years ago this year, the institute merged with the nearby Mellon Institute of Industrial Research to found the university we know today. Um, it has strong Scottish roots. The photograph taken outside my office represents some of the Scottish traditions, sounds um, that you will see on campus most days. There's a requirement in the faculty handbook that anybody from CMU speaking in public does so with a Scottish accent. It's taken me about four years to shake off my Wisconsin roots, but I'm kind of getting there. Uh, so a couple of years ago, you're going to be a good audience. Uh, a couple of years ago, um, I was asked to contribute a section to the university's strategic plan on libraries. And as we talked through what that might look like, we came up with the notion of the 21st century library. I'd been to enough conferences labelled 21st century library to know it was a, a thing, even though I couldn't quite describe what it might look like, which is what everybody asks me. What does the 21st century library look like? I truly don't have a clue. But what I do believe is that it marks a shift from our role as the campus community's primary information provider to something different. The reality, particularly in a university focused on the disciplines I mentioned earlier, is that much of the information content required by our students, our faculty, our researchers, exists on the network. They don't come to the library to acquire it. Frankly, I suspect they find Sci-Hub a faster way of getting to things than coming through our channels. But nevertheless, we have really become a rather boutique side shoot of the university's procurement office. So if you take our role as information provider as something that we have on life support rather than our critical mission, what is the role of the library in the 21st century? And that's kind of what we're trying to address through a number of initiatives that are underway. One of those is particularly what we're going to address in this presentation. I'm glad to see Lorcan Dempsey sitting there. He has written and spoken on a number of occasions about the shift of the workflow in the research enterprise. The recognition that in the 1990s and before then, the researcher built their information workflow around the library. They came to our buildings to work with librarians, to access content, to keep up to date. Today, for most researchers, they have a, an information workflow that exists entirely outside the library. And one of the challenges for us is to ensure that we integrate with the researcher workflow. We need to make sure that our services, our tools, our technologies fit into the way that today's researchers work in the online networked information ecosystem. Uh, as we think about how we might move forward, we recognize that the skills that made us successful as information providers have immense relevance in today's world, but we need to keep on top of the changes in the environment and understand where our skills might align to allow us to do things for our researchers that are done more effectively than anybody else in the marketplace. Two of the trends that I observe out there are those of open science and the evolving scholarly record. Um, open science has become significant over the past few years, partly because of the growing expectation that those who pay for research will have access to the products of the work they fund. We see a greater expectation of the ability to uh, reproduce 
the findings of research. We want to make researchers accountable for the results that they present to the scientific community. We know that the internet has democratized many aspects of our lives as citizens, and there's no reason why science should be any different. And we know too that open science can increase the visibility, the impact of a university. It's a bit of a stretch to say that it will drive us up the world rankings, but it's an important marker certainly of a university's presence in the scientific world. Another product of the open science environment is the way in which the scholarly record has morphed from being focused primarily on the outcomes. Think about the journal out article as the outcome of a research project. And instead, we see many of the other artifacts of the research process as being amenable to dissemination, curation, and repurposing. Whether it's the research process and the protocols, the evidence, the community conversation that are all taking place in a digital world, or the community review, reuse, and repurposing of the outputs of research. All of that forms a holistic whole that it's important for us as research stewards to manage. So as I think about how our libraries move forward, there's a bucket of work around our role as supporters of the student experience, whether it's about repurposing libraries to become more in line with 21st century learning activities and needs, or whether it's about helping students navigate the increasingly complex information landscape. We know there's a lot to be done there, but we know too that there's much to be done to support the world of open science and that increasingly distributed, evolving scholarly record. When I look at the commercial world, I see players like Elsevier become very adept at populating the research life cycle. Many of the tools that they have built or bought are trying to build together a one-stop shop for the researcher, for the research institution, and arguably for the research funder. Um, but libraries, in my sense, have generally been less adventurous, and many libraries probably could start with a life cycle and point to the publication space and talk about the collections that we make available and perhaps the open access institutional repositories that we provide. But we haven't necessarily been adept at covering a broader sweep of the life cycle. But remember my opening point about how, if we are to be successful, we need to integrate with the researcher workflow. This is the sort of stuff that the average researcher navigates every day. Increasingly, they are turning to a variety of tools and services that they access individually because they are convenient. I'm not going to try and stop them, but we need to understand how we fit in if we are to be accountable to our institutions to curate and showcase the scholarly work that our institution produces, and if we are to be accountable to the funders and others who place mandates around the disposition of data and publications emerging from the research they have funded. We spent a, quite a long time looking at a variety of solutions that might try and take us forward. We thought about building things in-house. We um, road tested a number of commercial products. And earlier this year, we announced a partnership with Digital Science, where we agreed to implement four of their main products, Symplectic Elements to be the campus research information system, Figshare to be our comprehensive data publications and anything else digital repository, Altmetric and Dimensions. And we've started to begin to map out what our take on the research workflow will be in a way that helps our campus community understand fairly simply what we are offering them. You can see from the slide that we are not just in partnership with digital science. I don't want this to be a putting all of our eggs in one basket situation. But what we recognize is that by following this approach, we can perhaps drive what is painted, I hope you can see it, on the world's most painted object, the fence at Carnegie Mellon, which students decorate almost every night, impact. That is what we are trying to help our faculty achieve. And we believe that the most appropriate way we can help them do that today is by helping them showcase their work 
and to take us on the journey, David. Thank you, Keith. So I'll be talking now about how CMU has moved towards what we call or refer to as our comprehensive institutional repository, uh, which is very pointed, as Keith had pointed out. These are topics that CMU has been dealing with for a number of years. Uh, but there was a publication that came out through this organization this past uh, May that highlighted the idea of looking at strategies for institutional repositories and rethinking how institutions view the repository, both as a standalone entity, but also how does it integrate potentially with the broader uh, needs and capabilities of an institution. So in that report, uh, there were three uh, institutional perspectives that were covered, and three of which are actually uh, ones that we'd like to be able to focus on today. Uh, the first one is, is noting that the repository needs to be thought of not as a standalone entity, but also how does it fit into these broader strategic initiatives of an institution? Uh, and then thereby doing so, how does the institution use the repository to showcase this work? Secondly, it's something that we've talked about very well through this organization, is that there is a path for institutional repositories to be seen uh, beyond just as a repository that is a platform but actually seeing a repository that can go from that to a bundle of services uh, or eventually to a bundle of related services. Uh, I think one of the things that we're looking at though is trying to think of the repository both as a bundle of services but also as a bundle of interconnected services. And then the last point uh, was there was a highlight uh, from the members of the executive roundtable that one institution was using Figshare uh, as the repository, uh, so we're here today to talk about that process. But before we do so, we should kind of note some of the historical context of repositories at CMU. Uh, so prior to the adoption of our new repository, repositories for CMU fell into three different categories, whether it be our archives repository built on Archivalware or what's now known as Novation, uh, our traditional IR uh, for publications, theses, dissertations, gray literature, technical reports, uh, which was powered by Digital Commons from B Press, and we lacked a data repository. As some may know with Digital Commons, it can be used both as a, repo a repository platform but also as a publishing platform. And while CMU was very highly focused on the IR side of Digital Commons, there wasn't a lot of work being done on using it as a publishing platform. Uh, at the time, it really didn't fit the needs that we were hearing from our campus constituents and trying to fill what they really needed, which was something to fulfill the data repository solution. So this is really what kind of draw, was driving our, our need to look at our repository currently, but also what else was in the, in the space, be open source or another vendor solution that could help us to fulfill that need. And as Keith mentioned, we, we, we did a, uh, an environmental scan of the space parallel to what was going on to the broader institution of looking at what was needed for uh, research information uh, management. And uh, we went with uh, our partnership with Digital Science uh, through Figshare. Uh, one of the things that we did though is in that entire process, this was not solely something done by the libraries, but involved many different units across the institution, all the way from uh, the administration with the president, provost, uh, head of research all the way down to individual faculty members. Uh, and this was something that we wanted to make sure we carried through through the development of a repository, uh, even to the simple thing of giving it a name. So one of the things we did was we, we ran a contest on campus to, to name the repository uh, with a, a small prize. And you can see from some of the numbers that we have, it was pretty expansive where we were getting coverage and involvement. And we felt this was an early way to uh, develop ownership of the repository by campus. Uh, I know many of you who work with repositories or work around them, uh, you maybe have heard where faculty are very unsure of what this repository is, they are not sure what's going on, you get contacted because they get an email because their materials are in the repository. Uh, this was a way to kind of deal with those early issues and have the campus take ownership of what the repository was going to be. Which then led us, we'll continue with the Scottish theme, to Kiltub. Uh, 
So this is our central comprehensive repository. Uh, it's powered by Figshare, so you'll see that it looks and feels very much like Figshare, and there's a point to that, uh, which I'll allude to in a minute. Uh, and then the card on your, on your right is one of our promotional materials that we've created to engage with campus. And this idea that the repository is there to weave the fabric of your research. And we'll talk about why is that phrase important and how has it actually um, empowered faculty to think about what they may put in the repository. We've also done quite an a lot of engagement around how to use the repository as far as creating guides and tutorials, informational pages. So making sure that we're engaging with the faculty and the students and researchers to better use the repository for their needs uh, and getting to this idea of how do we close the gap between ease of use and what we would like to see as a picture perfect deposit. So how do we get to between those two different concepts? So when we talk about the repository and why sh our faculty should decide to use Kiltub over other resources, we kind of have a few different uh, reasons that we can, we can point to them uh, between making it open, simplifying the research workflow, uh, but ensuring that if they do make things open, that they are doing so with getting the highest level of impact in return. Uh, so we do provide a DOI to everything that we publish in the repository so that they can track their citations and metrics. Uh, and this gets along to getting credit for the work uh, and being able to comply then with funders. We still see today that many funders are grappling with the idea of compliance and using repositories to say where things should go. And we see a lot of cases right now where publications are getting really fleshed out and decided upon where things should go, but data is another story. Uh, and with some in, uh, funders, they are suggesting the use of Fixture, which my colleague Ula will talk more about in a minute. But I think one of the last things which we deal with this question of, well, why should we use institutional repositories over you know, public repositories that are out there in, in, in the cyberspace, uh, which I think is one of the points is that we're here to help. Uh, the libraries can serve as a, a mediation point and a by proxy assistant for the repository uh, and to help with some of that overhead that dealing with um, d making deposits and making items available. And this alludes then to what comprises the repository team itself, which is actually a, a very dynamic team. You'll notice that there are individuals that are responsible for both scholarly communications, research data management, and other surrounding topics, but also is, often, is very much based upon the liaison model where there is a, a librarian that serves as the conduit between the libraries, the specialists within the libraries, and then the disciplinary faculty. So to reiterate this idea of a comprehensive repository, this is both combining what we would call a traditional institutional repository with a data repository uh, and being able to accommodate research data and what we refer to as scholarly outputs. So these two different categories kind of form the, the warp and weft of our repository. So again, this is how we're weaving the fabric of research is being able to try to accommodate everything one may produce during the research life cycle. Another point made in the CNI uh, Executive Roundtable report was this notion of the enterprise repository, that repository content, um, most of the time when it ends up there, it's a terminal point. Once it's been published, once it's ready for dissemination, that's when it goes to the repository. But there's this other idea of thinking of the repository as the collaboration point where the research can be developed and maintained. Now we know there are other solutions that institutions may use or researchers may use, but how could the repository be used for this additional activity? So this may be including uh, having a collaboration space or having a project housed in the repository. And there's all different types of concerns that we have to think about this as far as with security and uh, storage allocations and things like that. So this is something that we're still trying to grapple with, but it's getting towards the idea that if I can narrow the gap between where things are created to where they're disseminated, I can try to ensure that I can get more content made available through the repository. This also adds then to what type of integrations may be possible outside of the repository. And one such integration that I like to highlight is uh, the integration that Figshare has with uh, GitHub, where we know that many researchers today are using for software and code. And the benefit of this connection is that it is a true integration between GitHub and Figshare, where the researcher can authenticate their two different accounts to 
move content from GitHub over into Figshare, allowing for version control and using Figshare then as a place to publish as well as preserve the materials that a researcher may be producing within their, their Git repository. The next of these types of integrations include how does a repository integrate with a research management system or a CRIS. And there are a lot of different repositories that talk to for different ways with CRISs, and there's many different types of CRISs. So this gives you an idea of the repositories that you may see uh, in right now the, the most common CRISs that are out there today. What I'm gonna be sp talking about specifically though is the connection between our Figshare for Institutions repository and symplectic elements. Now I should point out that while both of these are from digital science uh, within the portfolio, uh, Figshare is actually the fourth integration for symplectic elements. Uh, predicated before this was actually connections for DSpace, ePrints, and then a connection for a data source harvesting practice from digital commons to elements. So I think there's some, some notion of that is looking at there's a wide variety of connections that can happen uh, between repositories and CRISs. And this connection is not a single flow, but actually a cyclical flow of information from one to the other for various reasons and, and for different activities. Uh, the first is looking at the repository to the rim, which is an activity of finding what content has already been made openly available and harvesting that information to match with publication records that one may find in the CRIS. That way, from the perspective of the CRIS, you can see a publication record and then verifying, has that thing already been made openly available? And if so, it, which repository? And then from the RIM to the IR, we have the ability to, to do actual deposits. Deposits that we are able to use additional API, say from Sherpa Romeo, to verify the, the version of publications that we can add to the repository, inform the, the user of what that information is, with also being able to provide local institutional context over that. So we don't necessarily have to provide the straight Sherpa Romeo information, but actually the library's interpretation of that information. With any additional information for deposit that we may require, that then can go over to the repository and be involved with our, our curation profile for the submission process. With these two things connected together, then we're able to monitor open access to see what has been made open access and what is not. One point I do want to make sure that we do stress is that the repository is not a compliance component. We are not using it to say what has been made open access and, and having any kind of power over that. This is just making faculty aware of what they have in the repository and how it reflects within their overall uh, research and publication view. So I'm now gonna turn it over to my colleague Ula to talk more about interacting with faculty. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ula Villetson, and I'm a research liaison for cybersecurity and information systems at Carnegie Mellon University Libraries. And I'm also a member of our steering committee for digital science and helping to implement uh, elements and KillTub throughout the campus. And I'm gonna share with you some of the challenges and lessons learned that, that I and my colleagues have come across uh, when it comes to working with the faculty and informing them about elements and KillTub. So there are a lot of great reasons why uh, faculty and researchers should use KillTub for depositing their data sets and their publications. And those, uh, I'll draw your attention first to the two that are at the bottom, making it open and simplifying the research workflow. And we can all agree in this room, based on our, our positions and where we currently work, that these are very valid and very important reasons why someone might want to use KillTub. But uh, we found that the two that are at the top, the compliance and discoverability, tend to resonate a little bit more with the faculty, uh, especially depending on uh, how they're viewing things at that particular time in their, in their research life cycle and their careers. Um, compliance, the word is getting out. A lot of researchers are now well aware of the uh, mandates from the federal government and from publishers about uh, where they need to deposit their data and discoverability. Uh, Figshare, um, and by extension, KillTub, has a very large 
uh, footprint on the internet. And uh, Figshare itself acknowledges that 60% of traffic that comes to Figshare comes there from Google. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about uh, why that's really important in just a moment. So for uh, funder and publisher compliance, here are just a couple of examples of where Figshare is mentioned in uh, both a, a government, uh, NOAA, and their, uh, their requirements for data deposits, uh, along with some other repositories as an acceptable place to uh, deposit data. Um, and uh, PLOS, also a publisher, uh, pointing out that uh, Figshare is also a, a place where data can be deposited for general purpose uh, studies that don't fall uh, neatly into one of the domain repositories that they uh, recommend. So why is discoverability through a general purpose search engine important? So th this is a, these are a couple of studies that were done in the past few years that take a look at how researchers are finding data sets. And they uh, agree on one point that uh, using a web search engine, a general web search en engine, which essentially means Google, is one of the top three ways that researchers are looking for data, uh, with the other two being domain repositories and checking in relevant journals. So that drives home that importance of making sure that data sets are discoverable uh, through Google as being one of the top ways that researchers are gonna look for that data if they can't find it in their particular domain repository or through the journals uh, that they read for their particular domain. And so I've done a test here where I've taken one of our deposits uh, over the summer into Killtub. It's a study that included a data set and a number of other artifacts for uh, looking at um, software ecosystems, culture and breaking change, a survey of values and practices in open source software ecosystems. And I went to Google and I put in four uh, words that I think anybody looking for, that, for anything on that particular topic might use in order to conduct their search. And the study that's in our KillTub repository came up as number one. And I've done this with a number of other deposits that are uh, made to Figshare that is very discoverable through Google. Um, so I did, uh, I'm, I'm never sure of what the secret sauce is going into Google's uh, search engine. So I controlled for location uh, using a VPN. Uh, it thought I was in Kentucky, even though I was in CMU's campus. And I uh, used a private browser to control for search history. And it always still comes up uh, the same, that it's very high in the search results. So I'm gonna switch gears a little bit now and talk about some of the implementation challenges we have had with our research information management system, or RIM or CRIS, I might interchange with those uh, uh, on campus. The first is curating profiles. So uh, in Elements, the faculty's publications are drawn or harvested from a number of data sources like Scopus and Web of Science and a number of others. However, not, they're not always accurate out of the box uh, when they run their first uh, uh, initial harvesting polls from those sources. And that's for a number of, of what I would think um, acceptable reasons. There's name variations at play here uh, where researchers may be confused with other researchers uh, out there in the, in the uh, ecosystem and in in academia. And also incorrect linkages to identifiers. And, and by that I mean that the uh, they may not identify a particular researcher correctly with their Scopus ID or may associate a researcher with, a, with the wrong Scopus ID. Or there may also be uh, more than one Scopus ID as we've come to find for researchers um, and they may not be including them all or including the best one. Uh, so we've we found or decided that, it's, uh, that we need to really go through and check all of the faculty publication profiles to make sure that they are reasonably accurate before we turn them over to the faculty members. Um, and that, that's required a lot of time and effort. Uh, rough back of the envelope math would say it's probably between four and 500 man hours in order to go through and take at least a quick look at every faculty member um, and for some faculty to dive in the, uh, much deeper in order to figure out why uh, their results are, are not, not close to being accurate and figure out what the problem might be. So second, we, we at CMU have a very decentralized campus. And I think uh, the United States around the time of the Articles of Confederation uh, between the uh, Revolutionary War and the adoption of the Constitution is, a, is a, a not bad example of the way things are at CMU. The colleges hold a lot of autonomy. Um, they hold a lot of control over their decision making. 
And that has created challenges for us when implementing a common RIM or CRIS across the campus. Challenges, for example, there are different expectations and needs for RIM among the different colleges. There's different annual review processes and forms that each of the colleges use. And there's also different, they have different current approaches to tracking their research output. They might be using different systems all together from one college to the next, which makes it difficult uh, instead of going from one current system to another uh, new system, we're, we're going from multiple different systems to uh, bringing everybody together on board on one common system. And then finally is technology integration. Taking full advantage of elements and all of its uh, capabilities would mean being able to harvest uh, information from, for example, our current uh, systems that hold grant information, uh, systems that hold our teaching information and evaluations and so forth. All of that can be harvested directly into elements automatically, but there may be integration challenges depending on the type of technology that's currently in use. For example, if it's been built internally, uh, it might need some modification or a fair amount of work from developers in order to figure out how we can harvest that and bring it directly into elements. And so uh, for some more lessons learned here that we've had uh, with both Killtub and, uh, and uh, Elements, integrating those onto the campus, uh, first is, is, is Google Scholar. So we, I spoke about uh, the great discoverability that we have uh, with Killtub through Google, but we um, have not found that to be the case with the Google Scholar. Uh, we were expecting better visibility for our research products in Killtub on Google Scholar, but it's just not there yet. They're not findable through that particular platform. That's under investigation. We're working with our partners at Digital Science and Figshare to determine why, um, but that's something that um, uh, we hope to improve upon. Uh, the second, uh, and these are, these, are, this, these are good problems to have, uh, as we, uh, when we rolled out Killtub earlier this year in a soft lunch, uh, we uh, got a, some interest uh, from some faculty to deposit uh, their data into Killtub, um, which uh, was successfully done, but it also drove home the need to uh, come up with a data submission and deposit requirements policy, so it would be very clear how we were going to handle deposits in the future for data and, and how, for example, we would um, negotiate that deposit based on the data that's been submitted and the, and the kind of documentation we'd like to see, such as readme files and data dictionaries and so forth. And also another uh, good problem that we found out um, we had was uh, a researcher also who uh, was uh, submitting a, a grant um, application needed to prepare a DMP, a data management plan. Uh, the faculty member had heard about uh, Figshare and Killtub um, and knew that this was something that would help uh, with the DMP and wanted to get some language from us about how to, how to include that in the data management plan. Uh, we were able to meet that need successfully, but it also drove home the need for some boilerplate language about Figshare and Killtub for faculty members for their DMPs uh, so that we could submit that or provide that to them very quickly. Uh, it's not uncommon uh, that we might only have a 24-hour turnaround to look at a DMP before it needs to be submitted to the um, funder. So having that uh, ready and on hand and, uh, and sent out to the liaisons was another uh, lesson learned. And so finally is, is the need to, to balance carrots and sticks when marketing uh, the research information management system and the repository across campus. So this may come as a, as a surprise, but not all faculty members are enthusiastic about the prospect of sitting down in front of a new uh, system and populating it with all of their information, um, especially that which may be incorrect or which may ha has not been harvested from an automatic source. Um, in those cases, we found that it's very important to partner with the administration at all levels to make sure there's a clear understanding that we are there to implement the, uh, these, these systems, that we're there to help the faculty members with these systems, but we're not there to, to direct the faculty members to use them. Uh, that, is a, that is within the domain of the administration. Um, to use the analogy that uh, one of my colleagues at CMU uh, uses in this kind of, uh, kind of situation that we are there to be H&R Block, we're not there to be the IRS. We really are there to, to help. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to uh, David for concluding remarks. Uh, 
Um, so now that we've, we've had a chance to kind of show you what, what CMU has been working on uh, for the past uh, uh, year or two, uh, we'll now talk about next steps and what is our, our future expansion of the ecosystem uh, at CMU. So our, our immediate next steps are to continue our role at an engagement of KillTub. Uh, we're doing this through our liaisons, department by department, in many cases trying to, to do uh, rollout to entire colleges when, when appropriate. Uh, and part of this rollout is also how do we engage with uh, our, our faculty and students who are using Figshare.com. Um, so one of the things that we have noted is that we do have a number of faculty and, and graduate students who have used uh, Figshare.com to, to house things that we would very much like to have in the institutional repository uh, version of Figshare. Uh, so one of the things that we've been able to do is by working with the vendor and identifying uh, with the user what content would meet our, our, our collection development policy and would be applicable for the repository. Uh, having that content migrated from Figshare.com into uh, KillTub uh, without requiring the, the, the user to have uh, to make that deposit themselves or having duplicates uh, both in the .com and uh, the institutional version. Uh, we're also now developing our use cases for our deployment of elements, uh, and these use cases include using elements as a supporting mechanism for uh, faculty profiles and various documents, CVs, biosketches for grant applications, um, other types of, of documentation, uh, documents that may be supporting uh, the annual review and reporting processes, uh, but also any kind of support that the system can be able to provide uh, for the promotion, uh, review, and tenure process, PRT, not PTR at CMU, but they're, they're different. Um, some of the things we're focusing upon for future expansion of the ecosystem is completing the research lifecycle support loop. So Keith mentioned some of the areas we have, we're supporting right now, what we've already made ventures into, but those are by no means the only things that we need to be able to provide assistance and support throughout the life cycle. Uh, some of the areas we're looking to expand now into is how can we support uh, different activities such as electronic lab notebooks, uh, protocols, um, and uh, collaborative writing platforms that would allow for, again, the researcher to continue what they're doing already in many of the systems, but having uh, institutional support to do so. Uh, so with that, thank you very much for, for sitting here and listening to our presentation. Uh, there is uh, some resources, information that, to give you more information about what we've been doing, as well as uh, access to our, our um, repository, KillTub. Uh, so thank you very much.